So just a couple of ideas about what to do with that then. Sometimes it's intentional, so sometimes people are, are afraid of the trauma memory and they're doing things to hold themselves back from it. And then what you need to kind of go into is kind of what they're afraid of, what the meaning of it is. In my experience, it's usually one of a few things. It might be kind of a fear of what will happen if they let the trauma memory in, like they'll be overwhelmed, um, they'll go mad, um, they uh, will get so distressed they won't be able to kind of calm down ever, or just that it will be very unpleasant, very, very unpleasant. Sometimes it's the meaning of the trauma that's the reason that they're not accessing it. So, for example, in, in the, for, for them, the, the trauma means that they're bad, you know, that they've done something terrible or something like that. So they're cutting themselves off from, from that toxic uh, feeling. Um, and sometimes what they're afraid of is more kind of how you're going to react to them. So if they tell you exactly what happened or they let themselves go back there, that you'll judge them negatively or, or something like that. So often what we're trying to do there is um, work on those meanings before we can get into the, the reliving and so on. Okay? So that might be just through kind of cognitive restructuring, look at evidence for and against these kind of beliefs. It might be doing some behavioural experiments. So for example with the I'll be overwhelmed, you know, you might agree an experiment where for kind of one minute you, um, you bring the memory a little bit, you know, in 20% or something like that and then measure how somebody feels, or you know, you might do things to kind of just, just uh, test out the beliefs that seem to be blocking someone from letting themselves be there. Make sense? Mm. This is an example from a guy I work with who, um, he, he actually wasn't a soldier, he was uh, a prison warden, and um, he'd had a horrible trauma at work involving like finding a body of someone who's um, hung himself. And after this had happened, he'd kind of broken down on a colleague and he'd cried. And this was interestingly part of the memory that was, that was worse for him because he was very deeply ashamed of having cried. And he had an idea that, that kind of uh, real men don't cry, right? You know, kind of classic um, macho thing. And so, and that was blocking him. You know, when we tried to do reliving, he wouldn't access any of the emotion in the room. He was worried about crying again, basically. So we had to kind of do some work around that fear. And um, we talked about kind of real, real men, you know, this idea that real men don't cry. And I said, okay, who's a, who would be a good example of real men? And he said, soldiers. Soldiers can't cry because, you know, they've got to fight and you know, they're proper, proper hard men. And I said, so if we Google image search, you know, soldiers don't, a soldier crying, are we going to find anything? No, nope. he said, not one. Um, it was like millions, millions of hints, you know. But it was really good because then we were able to kind of look at them and talk about, okay, what were the situations that these guys were in? You know, why, why might soldiers cry? You know, when might it be acceptable to cry? Because he didn't judge them negatively or think they were weak for sometimes expressing emotion. And you know, some of the images were from like funerals or where they were mourning someone who died. And so we talked about kind of the appropriateness of it. So you might do something like a survey or, or you know, sort of normalizing and shifting beliefs around perceptions of um, weakness, that kind of thing. So, with numbing, look for the belief, a restructured belief, test it out, yeah? Um, and then what you want to do is sort of try and turn up the volume. So you sometimes get people as well where they don't seem to be intentionally holding back. Um, I, I remember a, a young woman I worked with, she had a horrible trauma, horrible nightmares, but just could not get any effect out of her at all. She was totally numb. And we tried to find the beliefs and everything, and she definitely came from a family where emotions were quite repressed. But she herself didn't necessarily, she couldn't articulate any beliefs about emotions. She said, I know I need to do this, I kind of want to do it, but I can't, I just can't feel it, you know. So instead what we did, and this probably sounds a bit mean, but we just basically tried to intensify the reliving to make her feel something. Um, so you might do things like focus in your reliving on our sensations and at the affect level rather than the kind of the verbal cognitive level or the action of it but how how did you feel and how did that feel in your body like really try and get people to access the memory at a sensory level um, you might uh, uh, intensify the reliving in terms of things like closing eyes making the room a bit darker you not speaking as much if that brings someone out of it you know trying to do two things environmentally to help them get more into the memory and then you might do things like introduce triggers so if someone is getting triggered by something and that's where the affect comes online you can bring that into the room um, 
And with this woman that I'm talking about, we actually ended up doing a site visit very early on in treatment. And it was going back to the site that for her was the only way we could kind of trigger the emotion associated. And we did like in vivo reliving while we were at the place where the trauma happened. I could have done that virtually with her. It was a place in London where it was easy for us to get to. So we went and did it together. But if you can't get to the site physically for some reason, you can do it online. You can use Google Street View if it's a... Um, uh, UK based trauma where you can go and stand on the street virtually where it happened and, and relive it there that can turn up the heat a little bit um, if it's in another country that you can't get to you, you can also use Google Earth and sort of zoom in from above and usually see where it happened and get someone to kind of walk it through there and, and those kind of things can just kind of up the ante up the volume on the memory make sense? okay so let's just talk about Lastly then, the ones where they go straight out the therapeutic window and it's very hard to kind of keep them in. So these are our kind of our, our panickers, our high, high um, affect people. <laughs> and again, you might want to have a bit of a think about what's going on here. So sometimes it's the meaning of the trauma that's just intensely distressing and that's what's kind of pushing them out of the window. If that's the case, you might need to do some cognitive work on the meaning before you're able to do reliving. Okay. Again, it might be the, the meaning of the memory. So it might be the kind of, um, that people are so scared by like having a flashback or something like that, that to them it then means something catastrophic. A bit like a panic disorder, yeah? Um, I'm going mad. Some people with PTSD also have panic disorder. And what you get sometimes is when you're doing something like reliving, they get a physiological arousal, you know, the heart starts beating, and then it triggers into a panic cycle. They get a thought about that, you know, I'm having a heart attack, I'm going to faint, I'm going to pass out, or, or whatever. And, and then you might need to do a little bit of work on the panic to be able to get through it. So occasionally you, you're triggering a panic attack when you try and do the memory work. Imagery capability is an interesting one because there's research showing that there's normal variation of, of kind of imagery accessibility amongst the population. So some people find it really hard to image, about 10% can't bring images to mind. And um, again, they might be people who, as I was showing on the, showing on the previous slides, might show very low affect, because it's hard for them to access images. Okay, and then you might need to do more concrete behavioural stuff, like go to places that trigger them and do it there. Um, but on the converse, people with very high imagery probably get more kind of severe PTSD and get very more, uh, very uh, triggered by the memories. The memories are incredibly intense incredibly powerful for them and we need to turn down the volume for them and then it might be that we're sometimes uh, working with people who are a bit alexithymic I don't know if you guys are familiar with that that phrase but it's a sort of um, it's a very interesting idea about sort of emotions uh, people finding it hard to kind of label their emotions and all emotions just feeling overwhelming um, so it's not like it's like those people where if you had a 0 to 100 scale it's always 100 or it might occasionally be naught, but it's nowhere in between, if you see And sometimes then we actually have to do a bit of work kind of helping people recognize different emotions and rate them and notice that they do vary at different times and so on. Because otherwise something like reliving can be very overwhelming for people, because as soon as they access it a bit, it just feels like 100 the whole time. Makes sense? So again, these are all things that you would work on if you had someone who was very, very high going out the window. And in terms of adapting your memory work, we want to turn down the volume. So a bit like with um, our dissociation, you want to reduce the intensity of the reliving, eyes open, past tense. You might take SUDS ratings to check that someone is, is staying uh, within the, a zone, an acceptable zone for you both. Give them some control over it give them some strategies, grounding strategies and so on, things to do to help um, kind of reduce the distress if it happens. If you need, need to, you can always pause in the middle and just, you know, do a, a little kind of like check where they are and so on, bring them back into the window. We focus more on the kind of cognitive level of the reliving rather than the kind of um, emotional and sensory level, at least initially, so that they don't get as, as triggered. You might do written narratives rather than imaginal reliving because again, you get a slight distancing effect um, there which can help or you might do your kind of like bird's eye you kind of reliving or something like that again to kind of give people a little bit more emotional distance and I think what's really important with these people is to, is to make it very collaborative and give people a lot of control because I think very often people are 
frightened and it's very unpleasant for them and it's very unpleasant for you as well as a therapist and you want to keep them coming back you know so if they're getting overwhelmed and, and overly distressed every time you try and do it they're, they're probably going to stop coming so you're going to have to work together about kind of this and I often introduce the idea of a therapeutic window to people you when know, I talk about you know how do we get in that zone kind of thing so that we're not too high or we're not too low um, and, and give people some agency around controlling that as well. Okay, that's a lot of information. That's all the therapeutic window stuff. Any questions? Have you found, even after kind of reducing the intensity, that sometimes um, cases don't get into recovery, that it's quite difficult to get them to um, process the memory because you're using sort of all these different sort of techniques? I mean, I have had cases I've struggled with, <laughs> well, yeah, and, and I have had cases that haven't got better, but I think usually, the, th the thing is this, like the memory processing work works, mm -hmm. you know, PTSD is treatable, and often the difficulty for us as therapists is just making it work, if you know yeah. what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and with some people you can, as I say, do session two, reliving, straight through, <coughs> big brush brush and they might get better very quickly. Um, but for some people, you just have to do various adjustments to, to help them to be able to do the necessary processing to be able to get better. So it's often, you know, often the hard work for us is sort of working around the problem to find the way of doing it that works for an individual, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? which I guess is what we're really talking about today. Really what mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think for people like this, if you can get them into the window, um, and you can do the memory processing work, even in an adaptive form, mm. it should still work, you know. Um, and, and if it doesn't, you go back to your formulation and, and you think and you think again about what's going on and if there's something you're missing and you talk to your client about that as well. Yeah. You often find yourself doing some uh, panic related work when there's catastrophic misinterpretation is present. That'd be quite yeah. frequent for you. Not that frequent, yeah. actually. Not that frequent, but I have, yeah, I haven't seen that many people where they have comorbid panic disorder and I'm triggering a panic attack, but it does happen sometimes, yeah. But certainly working around beliefs about the memory where they're a bit catastrophic, yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily consider that panic because they don't necessarily have panic disorder, mm -hmm. but they're certainly um, very anxious about accessing the trauma memory. That's not an uncommon one, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Yeah, and you know, as I was talking about with you guys earlier, what we want to confer to people is a sense of control over the memory and not to be afraid of it. Because at, at the moment, they are, they're having these intrusions and they're having these nightmares and the memory is kind of controlling them, if you see what I mean. These techniques are, yes, we're approaching the memory, but we're doing it on our terms, if you see what I mean. So you want people to have that sense that, that they are choosing to do it and choosing how to do it and that we're doing it in a way that, that they will feel in control of. Because um, I think at least part, some of recovery from PTSD is kind of happening at a metacognitive level. It's feeling like, okay, this doesn't have to control me, I can control it. And there's something I can do with these memories, or there's something that I can do when I dissociate, which works. And that means this whole problem doesn't have to rule me. Does that make sense? Um, but I think as therapists, and I, I think this is why training is sometimes important when you're working in these cases, you need to be confident in that as well. You know, you need to go in knowing, okay, this, this is all right. It's all right if someone associates or have a flashback or has multiple memories or whatever. You don't need to back off it. Um, you can still work on it together because um, these techniques will still work. It's just the kind of the adjustments that we need to do. Yeah, if someone's kind of, I've noticed quite a lot, especially kind of with sexual assault, people are sort of using quite euphemistic type language. Yeah. Sort of not, you know, saying something like inappropriate or, yeah. you know, that he inappropriately touched me. Yeah. In, in the past, I've encouraged the person, to me that seems like distancing. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've encouraged them to say what it actually was. It actually was, yeah. Would you say that that is a useful thing? Yeah, in general, yeah. 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 I mean, so what you sometimes get when you uh, relive, uh, as you might have found, is, you know, like, you're doing okay and you've got a certain amount of detail and then they <coughs> kind of go and then he wrote me and then this happened, you know, and you'll be like, oh, oh, I think we missed an important bit there, you know. So I think we do need to help people to put words to what happened. Um, but at the same time, I would often have a conversation with someone about what words they want to use and what words they want me to use. 
because you might trigger someone, um, and also it makes might might take time before they're able to say things how they really are, and you, you don't want to kind of push really hard on that. If they're if they're more comfortable with a certain way of putting it than something else, mm -hmm. then another way, then then that's okay. But you know you might want to sort of approach that gently and gradually. Um, I would say. But what you also get are people like Amy, where they they aren't labelling it for what it was because they feel that they can't because they were to blame in some way or something, and, and I would obviously address that um, as well. Um, okay, so let's move on to um, the next kind of sort of memory issue, which is around working with multiple trauma memory. Before I do any kind of questions, things that people have been doing on in the break that you want to check out, or just plow forward, plow forward, okay. So multiple trauma memories, so I won't go into this in lots of detail, but as I, as I mentioned this morning, there are some kind of uh, conceptual reasons why you're more likely to develop PTSD if you've been exposed to multiple traumas. Um, and that's a bit to do with how our, our brain processes threat. So the more threat-oriented our brain becomes, which it, it very often is if we've had a high threat exposure in childhood, but also if we have exposure in adulthood, the more likely you are to process subsequent threat situations in a certain way, as you can imagine, because we just move much faster towards sort of um, anticipating, perceiving threats, and then um, storing them as, as kind of perceptual rather than conceptual memories which leads more to your kind of C-rep, or sorry, your F-reps, as, as Chris Boone would call them, or um, kind of trauma memories being laid down. Um, so that's why um, we're more likely to get PTSD if we have lots of multiple trauma exposure. <clears throat> and um, it, it leads to a couple of interesting issues for us as therapists. And the first one I want to talk about is kind of how you decide where to start. Um, so if you get referred someone who's had multiple traumatic events, Sometimes it's a bit of a kind of toss-up, you know, how you do it, especially if you're working with a limited number of sessions. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you some ideas and see what you think. Um, one of the things I often do is uh, create a bit of a timeline, first up, of, of someone's um, sort of life, really. Um, so this is one from a, from a client, you won't be able to read it, but it sort of, um, it just kind of tracks his life. Um, the different things that have happened during this, his life. This was someone who was, uh, he was actually a child soldier, so he'd had a lot of traumatic exposure um, for a long time. And then we kind of circled the events that he had intrusions to. So that was one way of kind of mapping out the kind of key traumatic events. And I think sometimes that's quite useful if you've got someone who's got lots of traumatic events, because it also sort of starts the process of, of putting them in some kind of order, putting the tra traumas within their overall life narrative. And it also means you can see a little bit like where the beliefs might have started and things like that as well, if, if there's some kind of long-standing beliefs. <coughs> Excuse me. Just choking on my own saliva. <coughs> okay. <coughs> it, um, I don't know if anyone's come across narrative exposure therapy before, but the kind of timeline idea is, is uh, a big part of this therapy. So this was developed for um, working with refugees predominantly. And it's quite good if you've got someone who doesn't have the same first language as you. Um, and it's a bit trickier to do kind of lots of written work on the board as you might do with a timeline. And <coughs> what you do in narrative exposure therapy is you, is you lay a, um, um, they use rope, but I wouldn't necessarily use rope if you're working with someone who's been tortured or tied up in their trauma, use like a ribbon or something like that instead. And then rocks and flowers to represent kind of positive life events for the flowers and rocks are the negative life events. The bigger the rock or the bigger the flower, the, the bigger the event, the more important the event. So the idea is that when you've got someone who's got a very long history of trauma, you kind of like lay this, this lifeline down and you literally do it on the floor of your therapy room kind of thing and then you take a picture of it so that you can relay it the next, next time. <coughs> and then um, the idea is you kind of come back and work on the worst, the biggest rocks kind of thing, which are the biggest traumas. So that's quite a nice sort of non-verbal way of expressing the same idea really, that you're sort of getting an idea of the whole, the whole life context. Um, I mean, I, I would then sort of slightly differ from narrative exposure therapy in, in the way that I would deal with the rock. So I'd then sort of do the sort of cognitive therapy stuff that we've talked about already, you know, reliving and updating and so on with that particular trauma memory. Um, another good way to start is to um, get your client to fill in an intrusions diary. So um, this is just where you kind of um, 
you get them to record um, when they've had an intrusive memory. Um, it, it, it's good to kind of put in a situation triggers because that just helps with learning to recognise triggers as well. Um, but what the key intrusions were of, and then get, get a couple of ratings, nowness and distress are the ones I would commonly use. Um, I can put a blank one of this in the drop box, by the way, if you want one. <coughs> um, and I, I just find it helpful if you've got lots of trauma memories to see which are the ones that are coming most frequently, which ones seem to be the most distressing. And again, it's a good, good um, kind of stimulus for then discussion, discussing with your client where you're going to start. This is a kind of easy homework task you could set someone in the first week. <coughs> if you've got someone who hasn't got a lot of English or um, they're not massively literate, I would because that's quite wordy, that, that form. I would sometimes just create a kind of tick box form for them where if I know what the kind of the main events are I just get them to tick if they've had an intrusion or a nightmare um, relating to that event during the week and, and you'll just start, start getting a look at kind of what seem to be the most uh, frequently um, uh, experienced ones. <coughs> the other thing to bear in mind is that frequency isn't the only issue, you know, it's also distress. So sometimes people have um, an event that they experience more frequently, but it's it's not the most distressing one, and they actually want to work on a different one. So this obviously is, is part, part of the conversation that you would have. And then armed with your intrusions diary, or maybe your lifeline, um, timeline, life, lifelong timeline, um, I'd often then have a bit of a conversation with people about their, where they want to start. Um, so if you've got a whole list of traumas, you might kind of rank them in terms of the, the most distressing to the least distressing, for example, um, and then decide where to start. Now, if I, um, if, if I get my way, I would prefer to start with the worst one because I think it's just more likely to have a kind of knock-on effect on the other ones, you know. It's most likely to lead to the biggest change because that's the thing that's troubling the person the most. Plus, if you're working with limited time, you kind of want to try and go in at the heart of the problem if you possibly can. But not, not everyone is going to um, want to do that or um, be okay with doing that. Um, so for some people you might uh, agree to start with a sort of uh, a less distressing memory um, and then uh, it might be that if that's gone well and they've gained a bit of more confidence in you and in the techniques and so on that they'll let you kind of graduate to the worst trauma memory after that. Um, <clears throat> you have the option to kind of work through it chronologically um, which I think for some people works quite well because you can sort of track then the belief build up if you see what I mean how beliefs developed alongside it. But the trouble with that is if you're working with limited sessions and actually the worst trauma happened later and you've done some good work on the early ones but you just haven't got to the biggest one, you're sort of limiting your impact a little bit. <clears throat> and as I say, the, the kind of the domino effect is more likely to happen if you go in at the worst trauma memory in general. Um, sometimes if, if I'm worried that someone is, is going to drop out or they're very ambivalent about treatment, I might try and pick what I think is going to be an easy win memory. So that might be one that would be quite easy to, I think it's probably going to be quite easy to work with, like it's a relatively short memory, um, there, wa there wasn't a sort of serious negative outcome at the end of it, like someone dying or a permanent injury or something like that, and the worst didn't happen, um, where it doesn't seem to be linked in with any kind of core beliefs um, or very high levels of things like shame and humiliation, which are harder emotions to treat. So if there was like a, a relatively short fear-based memory and I thought, yeah, that one's probably going to have a big impact quite quickly, I might work with one of those um, if, if I want a kind of easy win to kind of get someone engaged with the process and so on. So you'd have this conversation with your client and sort of work out and agree where, where seems like a good place to start based on, on the different kind of variables. <clears throat> and in generally, uh, my rule of thumb is if there's a small number of clear memories, like two or three or something, um, and the memory is quite clear for them, I would just do the process that we've talked about in terms of reliving and updating each one. But if you've got a lot of memories which are quite unclear, so this is often the case if you've got someone with a, an early life trauma history, like um, repeated abuse or whatever, the memory, you know, they might get nightmares, but the content's a bit vague, you can't pin it to a specific event, and it's quite hard to relive each one. And then I might do something like um, uh, uh, re-scripting, imagery re-scripting, which we're going to talk about a bit this afternoon. Um, or I might sort of create a, an overall narrative of everything that happened and then look for any sort of hot spots, bits of clear memory that pop out and then do that kind of more focused work on those. Does that make sense? Yeah. And what you can do as well is if you've got a trauma where there were like repeated <coughs> incidences of the same type of thing, so like uh, torture or domestic abuse where people were kind of beaten multiply, um, I might pick a sort of representational memory because you're not going to be able to relive all of them, but sometimes you can get one that seems like it's a kind of 
uh, a clear link to their intrusions and so on and, and work on that and, and hopefully you'll get a bit of a domino effect to other memories which are of the same type. Making sense? Yeah. <clears throat> the other thing to bear in mind, and this is I guess where the intrusion diary comes in, is that just because someone's got a lot of trauma, it doesn't mean they've got PTSD to everything, bear that in mind. You know, sometimes people have a long trauma history, but actually there's only one event that they're experiencing or something. And that doesn't mean the rest of it's not important, but in terms of where you focus your memory work, you're probably going to do it around the thing they're experiencing. But the other stuff that's gone on will obviously be an important part of the formulation. Um, and I, so there's a lady I'm treating at the moment who has a very long domestic abuse history, um, but actually what we're working on is an RTA, because she, she, that's the thing that is causing her most of the, um, the, the intrusive memory. Making sense? Yeah. Um, I find in terms of, sort of something quite historical that happened quite a long time ago in my book. Mm. It's difficult to tell if a person's got PTSD um, and there's a, or there's a lot of common avoidance of it. And, um, I've been advised by sort of colleagues that using the impact event scale is not all really that useful. Mm. <laughs> um, so, how often? Do you know, would you say that people need to be experiencing something for it to qualify as a sort of PTSD and a sort of Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I'd say two things. One is that um, it can be quite hard to distinguish rumination from intrusion, mm -hmm. especially for old traumas. You know, and you do sometimes get people who are thinking a lot about something that happened. And um, I don't massively like the impact of event scale, partly for that reason. I don't think it distinguishes very well. You know, it has lots of things like it's in my mind all of the time or whatever, you know, which kind of could be either, right? So I think when we're assessing for PTSD, we have to be quite careful that we're asking about think, memories that have an intrusive quality, mm -hmm. so they come in unexpectedly, not when people are deliberately thinking about something or when they're triggered by particular things. Mm -hmm. um, and I often discuss the difference with people, you know, between rumination and, and intrusion, and, and try and see. And that's not to say, you know, if someone has got trauma that they're ruminating about, it's not to say we wouldn't mm -hmm. treat them, but we just might focus it in a different way. So you'd probably do less reliving, for example, and focus more on the process of rumination mm -hmm. and how one that might be unhelpful and the meaning of the trauma and why, why it hasn't been able, they haven't been able to put it behind them because you know they're probably ruminating on some aspect of it like an unfairness or or a, um, a consequence or something like that um, I said there were two things oh yeah so um, the other thing I guess is with the diagnosis of PTSD it's actually quite a low bar you know to meet the threshold for PTSD for criterion B which is your re-experiencing you only need to be experiencing one of intrusive memory flashback nightmare, distress, emotional distress to triggers or physiological distress to triggers mm -hmm. and you only need to be having those things I think something like what once or twice a month to, to reach the threshold so it is quite a low bar you know so you might get someone for example who just every now and then drives past the place where the trauma happened and feels quite distressed mm -hmm. and that's happened in the last month and that would probably mean they met the criteria of being PTSD right? So you do get people who have PTSD but have relatively low levels of re-experiencing symptoms. Um, but what I might do in that case is still do what uh, I would consider to be a bit of a probe reliving, which sounds unpleasant, but um, just kind of get, do, do the reliving, get them to go back there in their minds and see what happens, you know. Because if there is still some unprocessed memory, hopefully you'll then, you'll find it, you know, you'll find the kind of affect and, and so on. But if actually they're able to do that, they're not particularly distressed, they're not holding back from it, um, but what they do do is a lot of kind of dwelling on some aspect of it, then I might kind of shift my intervention more to that rather than focus on a lot of memory work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's really helpful. Nice. Yeah. Do you notice on your timeline you had different colour writing? I did, uh, yeah. And, uh, well, I've been using timelines over the last couple of years, really find it really useful is complexity. But the important thing I think I've found is that to include the positive significant life events as well as the negative ones. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it, it can, it, see, people can be really surprised at the diversity of life events. Yeah. And uh, it really help with the hopelessness. No, you're and, right, and actually, it, yeah. it contextualises the, the traumatic stuff, so, so yeah. I've mentioned that. I think you're right. I think that's really important. And I think I'm definitely guilty of focusing on trauma because uh, that's all, all I think about kind of thing. But, um, and I like with the narrative exposure that you put the flowers on as well. Yeah. Because often there are things in there as well that, that people are sort of overlooking or they have a kind of generalised view that, you know, their life's been terrible from the word go or whatever. But actually there are often things in there that help kind of contextualise it. So yeah, I think you're right. I think it's nice. I think there are different, I haven't prepared lots of slides on timelines, there are different ways of doing them. And sometimes people do them in sort of categories of like, you know, 
life events, but also like where, where was I living and what were my significant relationships and education and work or something like that. So you're kind of like getting a full view of someone's uh, life. Um, I tend to do them more like just sort of the key phases of their life maybe. Because I think the other thing is you don't necessarily want to use loads of session time. If you've got someone who's, who's had a lot of life events, um, it might take you a lot of sessions to do a very thorough one and actually you still want to, if they've got clear PTSD, you probably still want to focus on it. Um, but I have had people where just doing the timeline in itself has been quite yeah. a therapeutic Absolutely. intervention and have quite a big change just from doing that. Yeah. What do you think about the concept of a small p PTSD? Mm -hmm. um, so is that where you, so I would call it small, small t trauma, is that where the trauma okay. isn't criterion A? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very interesting, I think, because um, in ICD-11 they've taken out the trauma having to be a certain threshold, right? So at DSM, in DSM-5 it has to be threat to life or serious injury or sexual violation directly experienced, witnessed or learned about as part of your job, okay? So it's got a, you know, there's a threshold for it. ICD-11 they've taken it out, so it doesn't matter what the event was, as long as you're re-experiencing it and you're avoiding it, and you've got hyper arousal symptoms, it really simplifies the diagnosis. And between DSM-4 and DSM-5, we got many more criteria, and between ICD-10 and ICD-11, they've really got it down to like six criteria or something. So it's kind of very interesting the way you, you think about that stuff. And part of the reason they took it out was because they thought the criterion A, as it were, the trauma level thing, um, was, was kind of irrelevant. You know, if someone was having the symptoms of PTSD, it didn't matter necessarily what they got them from. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what it does, I, I, one of the reasons it's been kept in DSM-5, I think, is partly around legal implications. Because, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a danger, otherwise I, um, I fall over at work and I can say oh, I've got PTSD. You know, like, the, the reason the threshold was put in in the first place was that we were sort of only talking about very significant trauma mm -hmm. and not just kind of distressing life event trauma. Um, I mean, I think I've occasionally seen people where the trauma wouldn't meet criterion A, but they seem like they've definitely got PTSD to me. But I'm always a bit wary. If it's a, if it's a fairly mild-sounding trauma, I'm always a bit wary, because it usually means either it's very ruination-driven and it's meaning-based rather than... Because, you know, you have to be pretty scared at the time for the memory to get processed in the way that we're talking about and therefore to need reprocessing. But also, often suggesting there's a lot of other stuff going on probably in the formulation rather than the PTSD side of it. If a, if a fairly minor life event has led to this big reaction. Does that make sense? It does, yes, thank Excuse you. Excuse me, have they, have they kept the helplessness and the horror? No, they've taken it out. So that's a bit worrying because you could potentially have a criminal saying that that had actually committed an yes. abuse, having a guilty conscience and then being having committed the crime. People do get PTSD to committing crimes. Yeah. But the, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about one that's potentially where the work has also been coerced into doing it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so... Are where they were made to do it or, or there? Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's... Yeah. Where yeah. Mm. I know, it's very interesting. I, I think it is up, you know, it's still up for debate, the whole thing. I mean, they took out, so in DSM-4, you used to have to have experienced fear, helplessness, or horror at the time of the trauma for it to meet criterion A. I'm taking that out now. And the reason they took it out was partly because of research with emergency services workers and, like, our military people, for example, who often, at the time that they're doing something, don't feel fear, helplessness, or horror because they're in, like, a professional mode, you know, they're just doing it, but later they develop PTSD to it. So that's why they took it out. But, I mean, it is interesting, it, it does mean that people might sort of get PTSD sort of retrospectively, almost, you know, at the time it didn't feel like a traumatic event, and then later it does for some reason, like, for example, they begin to feel guilty about it, or um, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so, let's carry on, if that's all right. So, um, I keep talking about kind of domino effects with multiple trauma memories. And that's because sometimes when you work on, on a biggie, as it were, it's got a lot of crossover with other traumatic experiences. <coughs> so it might be that they had lots of traumas of the same type. It might be that there's just a kind of um, a cognitive theme that links them together. Like, you know, they feel uh, guilty in one and, and actually they, that, that if you can work on that effectively with one trauma memory, um, it's, it's also true of other trauma memories. Um, 
So I think sometimes we can do things to actively encourage that kind of domino effect. And part of that might just be asking questions like, oh, that's interesting that, you know, now we're thinking that maybe um, you weren't as responsible for, for this as you initially believed. I wonder if that might be true of any of the other experiences that you've had, you know, just helping people kind of connect those kind of themes and meanings to other trauma memories. Because it's going to save you time in therapy if you can do that rather than have to go through the same process again for all of them. Um, and in my experience, sometimes people, um, it, it happens automatically pretty easily. Like you work on one of the biggies and the others seem to become just less distressing. Like the case I talked about earlier, Amy, I didn't know going in if we'd need to do some work on the childhood stuff. Turns out we didn't, it just seemed to update by itself. I think when we shifted the meaning of the adult one, it seemed to kind of help with the, the childhood one as well. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes you do some work on one and the others are still being re-experienced the same amount and you have to go over and do some work on those. Okay. The other thing is you can teach people <coughs> skills to apply to their other memories. If you've got someone who's reasonably motivated, especially if they've had a success experience of working on one trauma memory, you can often send them away to do quite a lot of the work as homework on another trauma memory. You know, once you've been through the process of like, writing the trauma narrative, identifying hotspots, updating and so on, they can do a lot of that themselves, you know, as long as they, they've kind of got the hang of it and there's not any concerns about associational risk or anything like that. So you can um, empower people to, to, to work on it, on it themselves, which is great for them and it also saves you time. Uh, any questions about working with multiple memories here? I just wanted to ask you, come across the converse a lot, the domino effect, but working on one had triggered another to be <laughs> more, more high arousal or... Uh, yeah, a little, sort of yeah, thing. yeah, a little bit. I think I have had people say, um, you know, especially if they, they've got a long history of trauma but they've been avoiding it for a long time, mm -hmm. that when you kind of open Pandora's box a bit and start going back to the past, then more memories come out um, from other things. But I would usually try and reframe that as a good thing. <laughs> they might not feel like it, but you know, if they've got the basic kind of um, formulation that kind of avoiding stuff doesn't mean it goes away, then I would get them to sort of say, you know, to, to maybe start timelining other other things that they've remembered, um, you know, at, at home or something like that, and then we can pick out which ones to work on. It doesn't necessarily mean they'll be getting intrusions to all of those things, you know, but sometimes it does kind of reactivate other memories from that period or other similar types of memories. And when that happens, would you stick with, at the moment with the one that you're working on? So like with the, um, the case that you gave, you stuck with the, the adult trauma, I did. even though in some of her diary there were reliving to the childhood. Yeah. I think because that one was all, for her anyway, that one was always the dominant one, the adult one, mm -hmm. um, like the most frequently and the most distressed one. Mm -hmm. um, it, there might be cases where you start working on one and another one comes up which is, seems to be more important um, and you have to sort of move away and work on, on that. I've had some cases also where people haven't told me about some memories and then later as we've gained a bit more trust or whatever they've told me about some other ones and actually I think those ones are really where the heart of the stress lies. Um, so you don't necessarily want to abandon ship or jump around too much but it, it might be that you you're not working on the, the, the primary target, um, but then you're just sort of, but you know, always you're discussing that with your client and kind of thinking about your formulation and so on. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, gaps in the trauma memory. Um, this comes from a case I was working with where um, it, was, it was a kind of medical trauma where she, um, <coughs> she was having a procedure done where she was basically having a, a central line removed, which is something that goes into your heart. And the removal is done when you're conscious, but you're sort of looking away from it. And there was a, but it's numb, the area's numbed, but you can feel some sensations. And basically the procedure went a bit wrong and there was lots of, uh, not wanting to be too graphic when people are just eating their lunches, but it was, there was a lot of sort of tugging, cutting, blood. It wasn't pleasant, basically. And she could feel things moving inside her body and she had a belief like, you know, um, A, they've made a big hole in me, they're doing permanent damage. And the nurse, I think, was slightly panicking and sort of, you know, not helping to reassure her. Um, but, but she couldn't see what was happening. So there was a kind of a gap in the trauma memory. But just at that kind of, just um, at the sort of visual level. Actually, this isn't 
quite what happened with the right slide for this, but anyway. But what you often get is people where there are kind of um, holes in the trauma memory, and that might be where one of their senses was impeded, like in that case. It might be where, yeah, they were unconscious for a little bit, in and out of consciousness, or where they were, yeah, intoxicated, drug raped, these kind of things. Not, not uncommon. And what can sometimes happen is, like, that bit of the music is, is missing, but people kind of fill a gap. You know, so she had all this constructed imagery of, like, gore and this hole in her chest, and she was having nightmares about this kind of stuff. You know, so I think we often do that. We have a capacity to kind of fill in the gaps with the memory. And those constructive memories can be just as distressing um, as, as real memories, if not more so, because they're often our worst nightmares. Um, so just quickly, I'm going to talk about what I would do when there are kind of gaps in the memory. First of all, I would use a, a timeline. So this is a slightly different use of the timeline, not the whole life, but just the phase of the trauma that you're working on. OK, so the individual trauma but sort of like screen by screen almost, um, what happened. And I would often do this if the trauma memory is jumbled in some way, it's not clear exactly what happened. I'd actually kind of draw it out. So, you know, um, I'm in the operating theatre and the nurse is putting the screen on, then next she tells me to do this, you know, I feel this in my body or whatever, and then map, map the gaps, basically. So that, I think that can be helpful because you sometimes don't know how long a, a gap is initially, or client might not know how long the gap is, but sometimes through the timeline you can kind of at least see where they are, and you can often like, get a bit of a sense of how long they are as well. Formulate the gap, I mean sort of um, try and work out why there is a gap. So for a lot of people it's a very obvious reason, you know, like they got knocked out or something like that. Um, but for some people it's not entirely clear why there's a gap, and it might be they were dissociated or, or something like that. Sometimes with dissociation, the memory will come back if you relive it. So it might be you can fill the gap a little bit that way. Usually if they were knocked out or something like that, obviously the, the gaps, you know, then the memory's not going to come back. Um, sometimes people are concerned about gaps. They might be worried about them, for example, that something worse happened in the gap than they um, than probably actually did, um, but they don't remember it, that kind of thing. So I might sometimes address uh, what their concerns are about having a gap and talk to them about that. Sometimes a bit of memory will come back if you do some reliving and especially if you go back to the site. Site visits are, are pretty powerful memory triggers. So again, you can do it in real life or you can do it virtually, but see if you can recover the information for the gap. Although bear in mind if you do that, that they might remember something that's unpleasant. So to discuss with your client first if they're okay with remembering what might have happened during the gap. If you can't recover any more memory, or it's a bit of the memory that's just not going to be recoverable, I would usually try and um, find a probable explanation for what happened in the gap. And then I would kind of write it on my timeline, like in a different colour. Um, so, for example, you might be able to access <coughs> medical records, there might be other witnesses, there might be other people there, um, police records or whatever, depending on the nature of what happened. And sometimes you can just kind of logic it out, you can just figure out where they must have been. So um, I'll give you an example of a guy I worked with who was um, assaulted in a nightclub and it was a very nasty assault and he was in and out of consciousness and he was being kind of dragged around the floor and he had these kind of gaps of memory like he remembers you know a bit of the floor here and then he remembers being propped up against the bar stool here and then he remembers being outside and it kind of distressed him that he couldn't remember what was going on during all of those gaps. So we mapped out what we did remember, we got accounts from his friends from what they remember seeing um, we went back to the nightclub where it happened during the day, when it would have been difficult to do at night, and sort of like looked at the floor and tried to work out, you know. And actually it was quite helpful because we, we knew he was in and out of consciousness, but we could see, we were, we were able to kind of like track his journey through the assault, as it were. And the gaps probably weren't as long as he had worried they were. And probably it didn't seem like anything much worse had happened during the gaps than what he remembered. You know, there were no witness accounts suggest that and things. And it's just much easier for your brain to kind of make sense of a, of a whole memory, a, a whole narrative, you know, even if you don't remember every part of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry, what would you do if, if literally you, you weren't able to address the gap in that way and you wouldn't actually know if something worse had happened and they just really just don't? You just don't know. Yeah, and there's not very much you can do about it. As I say, you can, you can sort of... You can just have the conversation with someone about what seems the most likely thing to have happened in the gap, you know, but, but yeah, sometimes you're not going to be able to get, but obviously, you know, you're not always going to get the story. Yeah. 
but I must say, nine times out of ten, I've been able, we've been able to kind of figure out at least a probable explanation, even if we haven't worked out the whole thing. But occasionally you do, and then, so that I remember there was a young lady I worked with who had like a drug-assisted rape, um, like a rohypnol one, and her memory is very poor quality, lots of gaps, and she knew certain things must have happened during those gaps because she had some kind of physical um, scarring, bruises and things like that. Um, and we never knew, and the perpetrators obviously were never going to say what had happened. Yeah. And then we had to work just more about her feelings and not, not knowing, and so we're coming to terms with not knowing. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so with my, um, just to go back to my uh, health example one, what we did was um, we found on YouTube, and this was, I picked a morning to do this when I was slightly hungover, which was a bad move, <laughs> but we found some YouTube videos of the procedure that she'd had and um, watched them together. Yeah, it, it was unpleasant, I'm not going to lie, but it wasn't as bad as in her mind, mm. if you see what I mean. And we were able to kind of figure out why they had been cutting and what the tugging sensation was and kind of put, uh, put words to those sensations. Because I think, you know, because she was missing those caps in her, those, the, there were gaps in that kind of musical score sort of thing, having a visual image to complete them and having sort of explanations for what she was feeling just seemed to really help. And it, it was much less unpleasant than she thought. And some of those ideas, like there was this big gaping hole, we were then able to kind of update it with the imagery of like what she could see afterwards, which was actually a relatively sm small scar. And she had this image that the, the, when they pulled the thing out, it had loads of like, tissue and, and gore and, and things on it and we were able to update that with actually like there was there was no evidence and, and when we found similar videos online it wasn't coming out all covered with stuff you know so some of it was her imagination that had filled the gaps and once we replaced it with a real memory or you know version of the memory even though we didn't know exactly um it, it seemed to just kind of bring it down a bit because it was it was it, it wasn't as bad as she had imagined it was okay all right so that's gaps any questions about gaps? Do you ever get, um, I suppose it's similar, not gaps, but insertions. You know, somebody who had a car crash, yeah. and she had a really clear image, because her baby was on the back seat in the seat, she had a really clear image of um, an HGV in her wing mirror, yeah. coming towards her and about to crash into her, right. which never happened. And what, what was your understanding of why she developed that image? Because that, that was her fear at the time. Oh, interesting. So I was yeah. going to crash into the back of me on the motor and kill the right. baby. Yeah, interesting. So she'd imagined it and then she'd sort of, sort of have intrusions to yeah, something yeah. she'd imagined, right? Yeah. yeah, that happens sometimes. And I remember, for example, working with a lady where her brother had committed suicide by jumping in front of a train. And she'd seen some of the aftermath of that, but she hadn't actually seen it happen. Mm -hmm. But she'd, she'd imagined what it must have been like. And then she'd started having nightmares and things about the moment of the train hitting, hitting him and things, which was something she hadn't seen. You know, she'd mm -hmm. sort of constructed it and then developed PTSD to the construction, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. So yeah, I would probably, what would I do with that? I'd probably treat it like a normal memory. Mm -hmm. So like someone was asking me in the break about um, PTSD to hallucinations and intensive care, which is quite common. And you sometimes also get people where they've had psychotic episodes, where they've had a hallucination, which has been so frightening that they've developed PTSD to hallucination. And they might now know that it didn't happen, but it feels real, right? Mm. So I think if a memory feels real, it probably is stored in the brain the same way a real memory is. So I'd probably still work on it in the same way, you know, really to update it. But the update there might be that isn't what happened, mm. you know, and try and update it with a memory of what did happen, which is them being safe and well and her baby being fine now. And, those kind of things. Um, I, I once worked, well, this is a long, long time ago, and I wasn't a CBT therapist at the time, I was yeah. doing sort of low intensity work, and I met a woman who's uh, worked in um, criminal uh, law. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what her job was now, but she um, she was in charge of hearing both sides of the story to yeah. make a decision as to whether it needed to go to like Crown Court or Local, okay. I can't remember exactly all the stuff now. Yeah. And the way she did that was she used to um, hear what was in her story and create imagine the, it, imagine it in her mind, yeah. and then do the other one, and then compare the two like videos wow. in yeah. her head. And oh, yeah. she came with PTSD because yeah. she like but gathered a, a huge amount of trauma ideas and yeah. visuals. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I didn't do the work with her. I um, 
yeah, but you could still work on, on that, I think, yeah. um, in the same way, I would say. But you might be able to do more imagery work, and the updates are very clear in terms of how I imagined it is not how it happened. Um, they, these aren't real memories, mm. I think, would be one way to work on that. Um, I supervised a case recently, it wasn't, it wasn't mine, it was one of my supervisees, but it was a lady who'd been on jury duty, and it was um, a childhood sex offender, child sex offender, and he, you know, as part of it, a lot of people were giving evidence about what he had done and the kind of stuff he'd been doing, and I think she was quite someone with high imagery capability, and she'd imagined it, you know, imagined all of these accounts as real. And she had PTSD, you know, to the things that she had imagined him doing, even though she didn't have any kind of, you know, direct witnessing of it. Um, but yeah, again, we treated it in the, in the same way that, that we normally would. Yeah. So in that called vicarious trauma? Uh, um, no, because I, in, in Criterion A, uh, hearing about something um, where it has involved uh, a serious Threat to life or, or serious injury is still um, part of the criteria A now. And interestingly, it's part of uh, if you come across repeated details of traumatic stuff as part of your job, um, that that meets criteria A now as well. So, for for example, ambulance uh, helpline staff, whatever, uh, 999 call operators is what I mean. Um, they're constantly hearing people in distress and potentially people dying and things like that, not seeing anything, not able to help them. But you still would. Um, it could, can potentially develop PTSD from that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if it's exactly vicarious trauma. I think vicarious trauma is normally like a further step back, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like that would be more like what we would get from hearing them tell us their experiences. Yeah. But they actually heard it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it was happening in, in real time. I guess. So, yeah. We've got an example where you showed about a person who had controlled tires through things that they've heard yeah. in the case of the court case. Mm. How would you approach that then? So we, um, what do we do? We timeline the, the court case, because it happened over several days, and we put in the memories, so, so it was interesting because some of our intrusions were to actual things, like the face of the perpetrator, and how he looked sort of thing, because she by then was projecting him as a very evil person, and she would get image, the true images of his face, so those were kind of highlighted as sort of hot spots. And then like people giving the accounts of what happened to them and then the imagery surrounding those accounts um, were in there. So we kind of relived the experience of the, those moments, her, what she heard and what she imagined. And then we updated with kind of what we knew, what, what she knew now. Um, and some of that, for example, was that he did do terrible things. He was found guilty. He, he's in prison now, plus the person who gave that evidence is now an adult and they, they are strong enough to come and give evidence against him, you know, so sort of up, updating, it's, it's funny isn't it, because it's like a memory within a memory, um, and imagined memory at, at that for her, so yeah, it's a little bit more complicated, but you work on what someone's experience has been, I guess, it's the easiest way to put it, even if that's imagined, constructed. Okay, so I think we'll move on and talk about sort of flexing cognitive work, but before we do I think maybe we will need a little shake, so do you want to all uh, just for a minute stand up, move around a little bit. <laughs> so those are some of the sort of um, common complexities around memory work or why memory work might not be totally straightforward and I just want to talk about some of the complexities around the sort of cognitive work. I mean as we've discussed these two things interlace with each other. Um, so it's sort of two sides of the same coin, but these are some of the things that I have got stuck with on cognitive work and I, I expect you have as well. Um, kind of long-standing beliefs or beliefs that have been reconfirmed with subsequent trauma sort of thing. Um, updates not connecting, so where you've got kind of a new bit of the memory and then when you try and bring it into the old memory, they are sorry, like a new meaning, but when you bring it into the memory they just can't quite feel it, like it's hard to it's hard to bring that in. Uh, head, heart, lag, people getting it intellectually, not really feeling it. Um, beliefs that fueled by earlier memories, um, self-attack, uh, shame kind of stuff, and then also like realistic beliefs, when something really bad <coughs> did happen in the trauma, the feared outcome did come true. Yeah, 
Um, just kind of get stuff on. Yeah. Uh, good. Um, all right. So we'll come up with some uh, some ideas of how to work on on these. As I say, I don't have all of the answers. These are the tricky things that people often get stuck on, but we can at least think about it together a bit. Okay. So um, I guess this is the sort of um, theoretical side of the multiple trauma memory idea in terms of beliefs. So. The way I often think about it is this, you know, when we're working with a, an adult trauma or a single incident trauma, we've usually got people who've got fairly kind of good uh, previous beliefs, you know, I'm an okay person, the world's safe, people are decent, and sometimes these might be a bit rigidly positive in the sense that if, if we have an overly rigid view of, of everything, so for example, you sometimes get people who are like, uh, you know, firefighters or whatever who built a big part of their identity around helping other people and that's a big part of how they feel about themselves. And then when something goes wrong in the trauma memory that, that challenges that, it kind of shatters, you know, it's a shattering of beliefs, basically. Um, and then it feels as if there's, there's nothing they can do, that they're not worth anything kind of thing. So with a single instant trauma, usually you've got pre-existing decent beliefs, the trauma challenges that. And then what we're often trying to do in therapy is get people to this kind of point which has a bit more flexibility in it. So it's generally positive, but it's not necessarily 100%. Because we know that bad things happen. We know that not everyone is wonderful. So we probably want people having beliefs like, I'm good enough, I mess up, but so does everyone, I'm human, um, I don't have to be perfect all the time. The world's usually safe, bad stuff can happen, but it doesn't happen all of the time, and so on. And people are mostly good, okay? So this is the kind of thing we're working on. But when you've got someone who's got a kind of uh, a longer history of trauma, and especially with some childhood trauma, they often are coming into a trauma with, with the opposite beliefs, you know, that they're not good, that the world's unsafe and that people hurt them. And when they have traumatic events, it just kind of reconfirms it. And then it becomes, it happened again because I'm no good and because the world's unsafe and because people are bad. So it kind of reconfirms it. Now our goal of therapy is, is the, still the same, you know, we still want people to get to those kind of generally positive but more flexible beliefs. But it's much harder, you know, because we're not just going back to something that might have been there before. We're often having to kind of build those beliefs up from scratch. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is the way I think about doing cognitive work with these types of cases. So I think you still start at the top in terms of the simple stuff. You know, I have worked with people who have got very long-standing, deeply held beliefs, and just around the kind of the classic stuff that we do in, in CBT, you know, the thought challenging, psycho or whatever, it's led to massive, massive shifts. So don't feel like you have to go kind of to straight to schema therapy or, or anything like that straight away. Start simple, you know, start with everything you know how to do. Guided discovery, psycho um, kind of reviewing evidence, all of that kind of stuff. It very often still works for people. <clears throat> but if you haven't got much of a shift through those kind of discussion cognitive techniques, I think you need to get more experiential. Okay, so this is where I get more into like, testing things and actually discovering new evidence for new beliefs and so on. So that's when we're moving to things like behavioural experiments, surveys, responsibility pies, the kind of like the doing stuff, let's find out, let's go and gather some evidence to, to learn about this belief. If you're still not getting a shift, what you often get there is a sort of head heart lag where people say, okay, I see your evidence, but I just can't quite believe it. You know, I get it intellectually. I, you know, I've seen it, your pie chart's lovely, thank you. But <laughs> I still feel like I'm at fault, you know, I've done something wrong or whatever it might be. And I think that's when we need to sometimes shift to a, a slightly different modality. And often that's where I bring in imagery, okay? Because we want to do something to help people actually feel it, to actually be able to access the affect associated with those new meanings. And I think that's where imagery can play a big role, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. If you're still not getting anywhere, <laughs> um, my, my concern then is that there's a belief that we don't really know about, okay? So that might be a, a, a core belief that you're coming up against that they haven't fully articulated or that you haven't, kind of, you haven't got quite down to the bottom of the downward arrowing kind of thing. Or sometimes it's something they haven't disclosed to you, like there might be another memory that's feeding this. Um, or a feeder memory from the past that keeps that supported. I'll give you some examples of these in a minute to, to kind of illustrate it. But does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So shift, shift through the gears, basically. If you're not getting a shift straight away, keep, keep, keep plugging away at it, but just kind of change your line of attack a little bit um, and, and try and get more into the felt sense of stuff. So I'll give you some examples. So I think sometimes with your updating, what you're doing is bringing the past and the present to, together kind of thing. You're bringing it in 
new information and bringing it back into the past memory. So I'll show you a kind of uh, a standard updating. Um, so this this is a kind of uh, and this is from a, this is from an assault um, with someone that I worked with where it, they, they're the kind of key meaning. So this was what we initially thought I was. I thought we were working on basically a fear-based hotspot. Okay, I'm lying on the ground, they're stepping on me. Terror, I'm going to be killed. I thought, okay, nice and simple, nice straightforward update. I don't die here. You know, I survived to tell a tale. I'm injured, but I survived to tell a tale. Okay, so the most sort of straightforward update you can have. I thought I was going to die, and I didn't die. Didn't connect. Okay, and that's because there were different layers of meaning. There was more there than just the fear-based stuff. So as you dig down, and as you do your kind of reliving, and you get this is sometimes where you have to relive so you can access all of the emotions that were there at the time. It turns out there was much more to it. Some helplessness, some disgust, some shame. I'm not fighting back because I'm weak. Sweat of body is all over me, a disgust cognition. People will think I'm letting him do this to me and I'm disgusting, a shame cognition. So much more to it than I'd initially thought. Another layer of disgust, helplessness, shame. And then what you need is a, is a much more complicated update. Okay? You need um, you know, some psychoeducation about kind of why someone's frozen. Um, I'm frozen then, but I'm not frozen now. And that's when you might do a kind of physical updates and moving as well. Um, you might do something around sort of um, the. This comes from a um, a paper which I can put in in the sh share drive. It's just an imagery scripting paper with um, skin renewal. So it's this idea for people that get a sense of contamination through usually physical or sexual, mainly sexual assault to be honest, which is a sense that they still feel something on them, a bit like mental contamination. You get an OCD. And they come up with this really nice model, which is that you kind of research together how often your skin cells renew. And our skin cells renew something like, I think, every two weeks when you're an adult, a bit more when you're a child. So you get a whole new level of skin. You know. So then what you do is you get people to work out how many times their skin cells have renewed since they were touched or assaulted in whatever way it was. And sometimes I then get people to kind of imagine it like a speeded up nature documentary kind of thing, like the skin kind of growing and replacing itself and, and it's quite a nice way of feeling sort of clean. So we'd have gone away and done that exercise and then come back with there's not an atom of him on me anymore. Uh, I don't want this, that's why he's had to force me, he's disgusting what he's doing. Others agree when survey that he's disgusting one, so we've done a survey as well to bring in new evidence. So sometimes your, your simple update needs more work basically. You need to get into all of the different levels of it and you might need to bring in the sort of experiential side of the, the evidence to help the, the new meaning to connect. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and I think you can ask a lot of your questions when you're doing your kind of updating um, within the memory to sort of stitch those layers together a little bit more. So, uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff we ask when we're reliving. You know, what are you thinking? What's going through your mind? And so on. Um, but then when you're bringing the updates, sometimes you can ask lots of different questions to kind of help stitch those together. So what do I think about this now? What do I know? What do I feel? Kind of get it through all of those levels <coughs> of the musical score. So that the new updated meaning that they're thinking about at all of those levels as well. I know it in my head, but how do I feel it in my body? You know, what does it mean to know that? And you can ask these questions like, for example, and knowing that, how does that change how you think about yourself? I'm feeling that, how does it change the way you think, whatever. Get people to really kind of stitch it together. Because sometimes what happened is the, the update's kind of connected on a, just a kind of simple verbal level, but they're just not really feeling it. And you can, you can help them stitch all of the new meaning like properly into all of the different levels of the, the trauma experience. Making sense? Yeah. <coughs> uh, here's another example of, of an update that, that didn't connect and where we needed to do it on more levels. So this is a, um, uh, from a, a military trauma, this was a guy in Afghanistan who was being shot at, um, he felt very afraid and again the key meaning seemed to just be a, a fear one, I'm not getting out of this, I'm going to be killed and the update was I don't survive it, I don't die here, I survive this. But when we were reliving, it wasn't connecting, it wasn't happening at an emotional level. So this is an example of the different levels, so we stitched it to, together. Um, back then, what was happening, I was lying behind the wall, it was noisy, it was very hot. How do I know that it's different now, what's happening now? I can hear the fan in the room, I can feel the cool breeze. Back then it was dusty and I couldn't breathe. Now I can breathe in and I can show myself that the air is clean and, um, and I survived. You know, I can feel that I survived. Then I was crouching, frozen heaven, heavy, now I can stand up and move around, okay? 
Then I thought, I'm not getting out of this, and felt terrified, my heart was racing. Now I know that I've survived and it's in the past. I can tell that because my heart rate is slowing down then and I can feel more safe. Then I was helpless and I thought I was weak for feeling like this and I felt ashamed. Now I know I'm not helpless anymore. Being helpless then doesn't mean I'm, I'm weak now. This would be from some cognitive work that we've done around the update. And I can do things like fast forward to an image of me playing with my son now, which tells me that I survived because I've ha I have that new memory. Um, and with this person, we also did a rescript where he went back and rescued his, his self from the, from the firefight. Okay? So your updating can happen at all of these different levels and try and tune people into all of the different sort of centres. Yes? Can I just ask you about rescripting? Yes. So, so you changed the past. We're just about to get into rescripting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'll hold that one. Okay. Let's let's get into rescripting now. So with rescripting, what you're doing is you're sort of changing what happens in the memory to give people a new feeling, a new experience of it. Okay. So you're asking people, what would you need to happen in the image to no longer feel that way? Um, and then you get people to imagine it and then ask them, how does it feel now? I'll explain more about the technique and then we'll come, kind of come back to how you use it. I guess to me, imagery is a very kind of um, flexible and useful tool. And I think when we're becoming metacompetent, imagery is a good kind of tool to have up our sleeves because you can use it in lots of different ways. So, you know, we've talked about kind of classic reliving, bird's eye reliving. You can relive things from different perspectives if you want to get a different angle on things. We've talked about updating, you know, you know about using imagery as a coping strategy, grounding, self-paced, to manipulate the memory to show people they have some control over it. And then with rescripting, what you're doing is actually changing something about the memory, changing what happens in it. So it might be that you change the ending, it might be that you change something that happens in it, so like bringing in the adult self to rescue the younger self, for example, I'll explain that in a minute. Sometimes you rescript nightmares, so if someone's got a, a recurrent nightmare that they haven't been able to shake even when you've done work on the trauma memory, you might just take the nightmare on its own and rescript, change what happens in the nightmare. Those of you who've done compassion work, you might bring in a perfect nurturer, someone to help with your feelings of shame. I'll show examples of all of these. Sometimes we rescript revenge, you know, we let people take revenge in the image if it's something that they weren't able to do in real life, for example, and they want to decontamination rescripts like the um, skin cell renewal one that I mentioned. I'll talk a, a little bit later if we've got time about traumatic bereavement, so there might be things that you do to like uh, change the, the, the memory in terms of how someone died, to talk to the dead person in imagery that can be quite powerful, to imagine them in afterlife if people have those kind of beliefs. And we might do some stuff with it, uh, moral injury, which I'll, I'm going to mention as five girl a bit later changing the ending, speaking to a, what we call a benevolent authority, but I'll, I'll explain more about that later on. So imagery, super flexible. I'm a big fan of it, especially when you've got these kind of stuck meanings and feelings to connect on an emotional level. Um, I won't go into the evidence base, but just to say, there's a lot of it at the moment. <laughs> uh, this is a relatively recent meta-analysis. I'll put it in your uh, shared drive for you but they've reviewed the kind of recent evidence on imagery rescripting. It's, it's looking pretty strong, both as a standalone technique and as a sort of insert to use as part of uh, treatment. Um, most of the research has been with PTSD, but it's actually imagery rescripting studies now in social anxiety, OCD, lots of these kind of things. So, anyway. so this is what you do. So I would usually have a bit of a chat to someone before we make a change about potential rescripts that they'd like to do rather than just do it in the middle of the trauma memory. Some people do it in the middle of the trauma memory, which is fine, but I think it's usually quite good to say to someone, and I usually introduce it as a, this might sound like a really strange thing to do, but kind of bear with me. What I want us to do is change what happens in the memory and do something different this time when we talk about it through, okay? If you could change anything about the trauma memory, you know, if you could do anything, what would you want to do in it? And sort of see what people come up with. Some people are naturally very kind of imaginative and, uh, and can immediately kind of generate lots of ideas of changes they like to make. Other people struggle with that a bit more and you might need to make some suggestions. But ideally what you're trying to find is a rescript that provides a difficult, different emotional experience to that that they had in the memory. And ideally something that conflicts with it. So for example, if they felt very afraid at the time of the trauma, you want to ideally do something in the rescript that makes them safe. 
So it might be taking them out of the trauma scene and taking them to a safe place. It might be like locking up the perpetrator and throwing away the key, or um, having someone come in to protect them and take care of them. If it's high, a high disgust memory, you might want to be doing something to help them feel clean, um, give them control if they feel power, powerlessness, and feel accepted and accept themselves if they feel high shame. I'll give you some examples in a minute. And then what you do is you relive as you normally would, up to kind of around about the hotspot, maybe just before if you've got someone who's really struggling to access the hotspot because you don't want them to get too emotionally distressed and absorb with the memory, so it might be a bit before that you change it. And then you ask them, what do you need? Or what would you like to do? How would you like to change the memory? And even if you've had a conversation about it beforehand where they say, I want to do this, and then when you're in there, they want to do something else, that's fine. Just let them go with it. They might decide they want to do something different in there. And then you try and get a detailed description of the rescript, get them to talk through what's happening in the new version, um, and keep going. And then for homework, we would usually do something to help people kind of consolidate it, like draw it, write it down, speak it out loud, listen to a recording, those kind of things. So I'm actually, just, I don't know if that slide is in here. Uh, it is, it's earlier on. I oh, changed the order on the train on the way up, sorry. <laughs> yeah, they're in there. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of examples, and these protocols I'll put in your shared drive if you want to read them. The classic uh, childhood abuse ones, which I think are really effective, came up with um, by someone called Smucker, um, and later our new aunts wrote about this. And what you do in them is you, you bring the adult self into the child abuse memory. And you don't have to relive up into the hotspot. You can bring, it, bring in the adult self at the point at which your, the, the memory is starting to become a little bit fearful. So you relive it from the child's perspective initially. Bring in the adult self. And then you switch to the perspective of the adult self. And you ask the adult coming into the memory, what do you see? What's going on here? And what do you want to do? And usually what they will want to do is comfort or rescue the child. Um, get them away from danger. Sometimes they want to confront the perpetrator or do something there. Um, and then you switch back to the child perspective and you get the child, and then you sort of re experience what that's like for the child to be rescued and cared for and made safe. Okay, and then you ask the child in, in the kind of um, re script, is there anything else you want? Is there anything else you need? And if they want something else, then the adult self can do something else. Yeah, and you sort of do that thing of switching between the adult self and the child self. It's, it's very powerful. Has anyone tried this before? Yeah. yeah. I tried that recently with a yeah. client who got a lot of, um, sort of, a lot of childhood memories. Mm. She found it really helpful. And one of the things that she also found was that she was able to kind of um, apply this idea of herself in kind of, um, the sort of adult self in other situations in her life that kind of came, <coughs> came up. So Brilliant. sort of just using that, that mm. imagery work, she could so it was a kind of slightly challenging situations that she coped, that she sort of paid into. Oh, good, yeah. Um, so yeah. now I found it really... That's interesting, really isn't it? Yeah. Helpful. I mean, schema therapy, that would be thought of as like you're developing the healthy adult mode there, you know, and then it's easier for people to use that mode at the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And one of the sort of later um, kind of uh, variations on it with the ANTS protocol, which I'll put in your Dropbox, was that sometimes the therapist comes in as well. So if the so I would usually try and get the person to rescue their child self, do it themselves if they can. But some people get a bit um, frozen up when they go in, either because they're still quite frightened of the perpetrator, or because um, like they might be blaming the child still, you know, because it's them, it's their younger self, you know, and and they can sometimes they can't do what they need to do to comfort or rescue the child, and then you kind of come in as the therapist and. Um, in the arts protocol, you sort of you get in between the child and the adult, uh, sorry, and the perpetrator, and you speak to the perpetrator and you say, you like you're clear and firm, and say you need to stop this. It's not fair. This child hasn't done anything to deserve it. You know that, that what you're doing is not okay. It's not acceptable. And then you kind of say to the person, can you see me saying that? Can you hear me saying that? And they'll usually say yes. Say, is there anything else you want me to do? Is there anything else? So that you're sort of taking direction from them. And sometimes they can, their adult self will later be able to do it, but they just might need some support initially from you as a therapist to, to help them do it. You're kind of like modelling it, but within the memory. Make sense? The first time I did it, I felt a bit weird, I must say. But it, it's quite effective. Because really, if you think about it, what you're doing is just supporting your person with that new view of what happened. You know, 
you're just helping them bring that meaning in. Um, but you're just doing it through medium of, of imagery. Do you just stick? Oh, sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. Just a no, no, you first. Oh, okay. um, do you just stick to those four? Because I followed like I followed the arts protocol, just those those kind of four questions. And sometimes I did. One of the things I found was that I, I was a bit self-conscious that I was just repeating right. myself, and I didn't know whether I could kind of deviate away from that yeah. script. And, yeah, yeah, off freestyle a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, just, I mean, it dep- I, th- I think you can be very um, creative within this mm-hmm. type of rescripting. So there are protocols, but I don't think you have to follow them to the letter. Yeah, yeah. But they're a good place to start, especially if you're not very confident. You know, the reason the protocols is because they've done research trials, so they've written it out step by step. You don't have to follow it exactly. And also, if there's something your client wants you to do that's not in the protocol, yeah. then, you know, then you, you can yeah. do it, yeah. yeah. It's smashing my head slightly. I have never, I have never done it um, like yeah. this. Um, so when you've done that, what do you need? Is to, do you carry on with the memory as no. it happened? You stop no. there. You stop there, yeah. So you don't go back to the original memory. So with updating, you're right, you might bring an update and then you might return to the memory, as it were. But with rescripting, you move away from the original memory and you then kind of relive the new version, mm-hmm. as it were, which is your rescripted version. So this could be from to access a sense of being cared for or to access a sense of being strong. Yeah. For an adult man yeah. With that knowledge now. Yeah. So these, these are the kind of classic child abuse protocols, which you can read about. But... I think you can also do all sorts of interesting and creative things with imagery rescripting. Has anyone, uh, any Harry Potter fans? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Boggarts? Yeah. Yes. You transform them into something to make them ridiculous so that they're less frightening. Yeah. And in some of our rescripts, we, we make the, the thing or the feared object silly so that you can kind of overcome it. There was a guy I worked with where he had been tortured and his main intrusion was these guards coming into his cell just before they tortured him. He had lots of intrusions of their faces and things because they looked very serious and scary. And we transformed them into like clowns. They came in doing like a juggling routine with like skateboards and like brightly coloured clothes and things like that. And it just made them ridiculous and silly. It took away the fear and then he would laugh, he could laugh at them. And it just sort of, it it doesn't change what happened, but it it gave him just a sort of, a, a. a sense of control and it felt good for him to be able to laugh at them and not be able to fear them and then I made him draw them for homework with their like silly outfits on and things like that. Um, you can do like power and mastery ones so this was from a lady who she uh, her abusive husband she shrank him down to be this little tiny thing and then she let her cat like toy with him and chase him <laughs> around the living room that was quite fun. Um, got, I've got a client who's got a guardian angel that's a <coughs> compassionate image she brings in the guardian angel to the um, to the images to, to kind of give her support and um, comfort and tell her that she hasn't done anything wrong and that she's a good person. Um, this is the from the um, skin renewal one, so as well as the, the Im- imagining the um, skin renewal process, you can also imagine like taking off the skin, so people sometimes imagine like it's a wetsuit and they take it off, or like they've been painted, you know that glue when you're a kid that you painted your hands with and then you could peel it off and that felt quite good, sometimes get people to do that, it's sort of imagery around kind of cleanliness, um, that one. Um, I've, got a, I've got a client who transforms into like a samurai warrior and she really good, goes to town on people, like she's pretty aggressive in her image, fine. I don't mind people being violent in their images as long as they aren't violent in real life, it's only imagination. Um, bringing in the adult self and so on. Okay, so it's a varied and potentially creative process and it's really good fun. So, just before we have our coffee break, let's have a go. So, I want you to think that you're working with a client with a physical assault history, and you're working on a hotspot where she's been held in a room. She wants to get out, she can't get out, he's blocking the door. (coughs) Cognitions are, I can't get out, he's going to kill me, fear and helplessness. So, I'm going to give you a bit longer with this one, sort of like maybe 10 to 15 minutes so with somebody near you maybe just have a think about what type of rescript could you develop doesn't matter use your imagination anything that kind of feels right to the situation or speak to your clients so one of you is the therapist one of you is the client sorry i probably should have said that at the start Um, and let your client sort of think about what she might want to rescript and then just have a go at the process of bringing it in you don't have to do the whole, you know, you won't have time to do the whole thing. But just to kind of get used to the idea of introducing the idea. 
Does that sound okay? Yeah, and then we'll do briefly back and then we'll have coffee. Okay.